Yes, so the main responsibility is maintaining the dam in a state of good repair, um, which requires removing any debris that may wash above from trees that fall down, as well as maintaining the fish ladder and some of the other components. Every five years, the town has to contract with an engineer to do a dam inspection report and evaluate the condition of the dam. There's also, you know, ongoing maintenance that may come up throughout those dam reports that the town has to take on. So, yeah, so we did um, a pretty intensive, we call it a feasibility study, um, evaluating all of the pros and cons, potential impacts from dam removal um, before you get into the real detailed design work. We had uh, historical consultants working for us who dug up all of the, the detail of this historic site and historic dam and historic mill complex. Um, so there will have to be efforts during any potential dam removal to honor that legacy. Um, we looked at uh, the biggest impact, potential impact, is to the mill building directly upstream from the dam, currently owned by EBSCO. So that building was constructed in the late 19th century at a time when many buildings of its age were constructed on wooden pilings for supports. And that is generally done in marshy or um, environments without sound ground underneath it. So being on the edge of a river, this is one potential for that. But from doing going outside on the perimeter with borings and test pits and doing geophysical work, ground penetrating radar inside the building, which essentially is a way to kind of look through the concrete into what's underground. We are moderately confident that the support for this building is all concrete and therefore would not rot under a, a dam down scenario. There's some more future work still going on to confirm that, but that's the current uh, finding on that. We looked at impacts to other structures along the river, and essentially that is modeling of what, how the river flow and velocity and water levels might change in terms of eroding away, retaining walls and buildings and, and bridges and that sort of thing. And the impacts from dam removal are all in the range that can be easily accommodated during design to make sure no undue impacts occurred from that. We looked at recreation impacts to be sure that paddling could still occur, and it could with passage from above to below the dam possible in the future that is not currently possible, so that's a big, a big addition. Essentially the finding is that things point to uh, a really a net benefit for fish passage and ecology and habitat with minimal impacts that can be addressed during the design process to make sure that this is a, a healthy, good project for everybody. What I'd like to touch upon just briefly is the significance of the efforts in this part of Massachusetts, the Ipswich River, Parker River, for habitat restoration, in particular for diadromous species, um, from a regional context. The Ipswich River right now, as many of us know, does not have an awful lot of fish in it, uh, diadromous fish. Uh, and these efforts um, are hopefully going to turn that around with multiple dam removals, bypass channels, um, and we will hopefully get a you know, a reasonably significant run of fish some, someday in the future in this system. Where that fits in the regional perspective is really all about resilience. Even small runs of fish are important. We have runs up in Maine to multiple millions of fish per year migrating. Those are super important from a, from a complete biomass perspective. But having small runs of hundreds of fish even, thousands of fish, tens of thousands, all the small systems all of these used to have fish in them. For us, it's all about resilience and, and having multiple runs of fish through as many systems as possible, not knowing what the future will bring. So over the centuries, the Ipswich Mills Dam has had a lot of impacts on diadromous fish uh, in the Ipswich River. 
being ahead of tide dam is a really important factor in this because it's basically placed right as these fish that are trying to go between fresh and salt water to complete their life cycle are making that transition. So fish that are anadromous like river herring and shad and historically salmon couldn't get into fresh water to spawn and eels which need to go back out to salt water after spending most of their life in fresh water might have difficulty going downstream. Um, and for centuries, that was probably a pretty complete block. More recently, we have a state-of-the-art fishway, more or less, at the dam, which helps with passage, but only provides passage under certain conditions and for certain species. So it doesn't really provide a broad continuum of passage for all species in the river, or even great uh, passage at times for the species it's designed for. So removing the dam would have so many benefits for aquatic organisms, and especially diagenous fish in the Ipswich River, because there'd no longer be a barrier to passage, and no longer be flow-dependent barriers, and we just have free passage for all these fish, and by free I mean unimpeded. Um, and that's going to make a big difference in the, restoring those populations to the river. So I'm Kate Abbott, I'm a PhD candidate at UMass Amherst and I've been studying um, the impacts of dams and dam removal across Massachusetts for the past four years. Some of the most important and consistent impacts we've seen um, resulting from dam removals across the state is this increase in dissolved oxygen levels. Um, so just like humans need oxygen to breathe and to survive, so do fish and aquatic insects. Um, they just get it from whatever's dissolved in the water column rather than from the air directly. And so some small dams can create these stagnant pools of water and accumulate sediment and other organic materials that can really drive that dissolved oxygen levels down. This low dissolved oxygen can create this physical stress for fish and other organisms and result in maybe mortality and ultimately change the community composition towards more like tolerant species that you might not normally see in a flowing river system. So what we've found at UMass is that dam removal can relatively quickly improve dissolved oxygen levels to reach that of some of the upstream reference conditions that we use for comparison. And so this is important because fish and other sensitive species can then use this critical water quality parameter and really quickly recolonize um, this newly available habitat created after dam removal. We haven't actually entered the permitting process quite yet. We're finalizing designs at this point and um, we're hoping to get into that in the next few months. The permitting process is where the project will be evaluated against state, federal, and uh, local laws to make sure that it's in compliance with all of the legislation and guideline that's out there for these types of projects. Um, that process usually takes one to two years to get through. The dam has not always been there, but there's, there was always a little bit of a mill pond there. It was referred to as the Upper Falls, and people who've looked over at the County Street uh, off that bridge, you can see that there's a Lower Falls. And I think maybe the Upper Falls was not as much of a, a rapids as we see down below, but there is something there. We don't know what it is. It, was, it wasn't till uh, there, there's been a dam of some sort there for, for almost since the whole time that there's been a town, but it wasn't the, the big dam that goes across the river until maybe around uh, 1828 they, they uh, built the first real dam, and then it was raised in 1858, and that's when we began seeing uh, the, the pond up above the dam uh, began to widen. Uh, and in fact, uh, we know that because the owners of the property were compensated for taking of land. Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of different uh, uh, dams, the various kinds of dams there. And the modern one today is what we all uh, know from, from our own experience, but it's not what's always been there.